Thank you so much, all of you folks, for coming, and especially thank you so much for uh, uh, our panelists uh, that you made it here. And uh, I'm very excited to have many interesting uh, people on the stage here today. So um, yeah, let's get into it. I would say let's start with a round of introductions. Uh, so please uh, 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 tell us uh, what project are you from, what you work on within the project. And uh, we are at DEF CON, so mention maybe your favorite cute animal or something like that. <laughs> favorite cute animal of yours? <laughs> sure. Uh my name is Paul Hauner, a uh, co-founder of Sigma Prime, which is the company that maintains Lighthouse. Also, I guess a co-founder of Lighthouse. Uh, I've been working on Ethereum staking since about 2018, was involved in founding Lighthouse, have written a good chunk of the code on that. Um, and now in the day-to-day, -day, I'm um, kind of, I guess, overseeing project managing, still engineering as much as I can. Uh, my favorite animal is a quokka, Australian animal. Ooh, I love quokkas. <laughs> so oh, I love quokkas so much, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, hi, I, I'm Chris. I'm co-founder of a company called L2Beat, and the two stands not for uh, Ethereum 2, uh, but for Layer 2. So uh, we're, we're working on uh, researching and providing analytics for different Layer 2 scaling solutions. Um, and we're also running a bunch of nodes, including uh, EVE 2.0 node. There is no e Hello, I'm uh, Diego from Ethereum on Arm. I'm the founder of, of the project. Uh, our main goal is to contribute to the decentralization of, of the Ethereum network by providing uh, uh, some kind of images for, for uh, these kind of devices like uh, uh, Raspberry Pi or, or Rock 5 and turn them into a full Ethereum node pretty much uh, automatically and this way uh, make it easy for, for uh, regular users, home users, to run a, a full node in these uh, low power and resource constrained devices. And so this way we can uh, facilitate this uh, for, for people to run, to run nodes at home in validators. Uh, my name is Nick Sorkish. I am um I work at eStaker. eStaker is a completely volunteer-run organization, and we facilitate community education and uh, uh, staking, encourage people to stake. We provide guidance and do technical support for stakers. So we're just connecting stakers to the appropriate uh, protocols that they can use to stake. Oh, my favorite animal. Can I be boring and just say a cat? Uh, great. Oh, my, my favorite uh, animal is, is the cat as well. I have two. I, I have two. Wait, you <laughs> so, copied me. Yeah, I, I have two. Oh, okay. I love it. I, I love cats and I Three love cats. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Uh, I also have a cat. Yeah. I think it's kind right. of Ethereum culture vibe. There are so many cat people here. And um, yeah. I mean, cats are a great so source of entropy, right? I mean, it's also something which is which is important in cryptography. Okay. Um, anyway, thank you so much for the introductions. Uh, and I'm Mario Havel. I'm from Ethereum Foundation Protocol Support. And um, yeah, so um, the merge, um, it's, uh, it's something which I've been also contributing to. Which Co the congrats. Oh, oh yeah, congrats. Whoa, it happened. But we, we celebrated a lot, the merge. So like, uh, we are over all the celebrations and now I think it's time to discuss what's next because the merge, the merge was just the beginning. There is yeah. no time to rest and we need to build, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so maybe let's start with some reflection. So um, how, uh, how was the merge for you, for your project, but especially what it changed? Was there some challenges that you had to overcome and now after the merge, what are you facing? Some, uh, some new issues, new challenges, new changes in, in your projects? Okay. Uh, yeah, for in, in, from our side, uh, we were running uh, nodes uh, on uh, Raspberry Pis. We have uh, several several boards, and after the merge, we were facing two two main issues. Uh, first of all, we we seen uh, uh, from some clients some issues with uh, performance, and uh, later we realized that uh, the Raspberry Pi was a little tight because uh, the hardware requirements after the merge uh, rise a little. So this is a device from 2019 and it's a little old. And we are struggling to get uh, notes in sync with the Raspberry Pi. We really uh, 
achieve this with uh, Geth and, and Nimbus, but it's uh, it's becoming a little uh, harder for us to to keep up with the chain on, on a Raspberry Pi. But uh, hopefully, uh, there is a new device coming up this this month called uh, Rock Five that is much more powerful. And actually, we are validating uh, with this with this device and with Bessu and Teku, so it is a really powerful device, and it's it's running great. So, for one side. Uh, hardware problems uh, in terms of, of performance, but uh, from the other side, we still can uh, run uh, full nodes in Ethereum with these kinds of, of devices. So, it's running on. Okay, I guess that's my turn. <laughs> okay, so, uh, as I said, probably I'm the, the least experienced person here in, in terms of uh, if uh, POS but uh like just barely like one month ago i, I we spinned up our you know uh if um, pos notes to to prepare for the merge everything went smooth so my experience with the merge itself was was really great but in my previous life i was a DeFi engineer i worked at MakerDAO, and uh, now i've started running a survey uh within my colleagues you know blockchain engineers DeFi engineers like do you know how if works after POS and the answers are no they don't have a clue and I I know like 50% about I, I think the word after POS so I think the biggest challenge now is like education there's a lot of like you know talks about if 2.0 whatever but they are outdated because you know the spec changed so much and uh, yeah that's 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 a huge challenge I think right now I'm gonna echo that um, just because uh, progress is happening so crazy quickly. Everything becomes so out of date so quickly that people come to us and they say, I'm, f I'm using this uh, guide, but this thing didn't work and all of a sudden this command is different. And so education is one of the things that eStaker focuses on and it hasn't really changed before or after the merge. We did have a month or two around the merge where we were helping people prepare for the merge, but now it's it's just focusing on education, documentation, and matching people to the appropriate protocol. Cool. Uh, yeah, so uh, working on a consensus client implementation, the merge was kind of like a four-year project for us, so it's been going for a while. Um, it's been stressful, it's been fun, uh, it's been really uh, enlightening. The merge itself was, um, it was a little bit of a non-event, actually, which is kind of what we wanted. It went better than any of our tests. Um, so yeah, it's been um, it's been interesting just trying to figure out um, what to do in a post merge world. There's there's plenty to do, but yeah, just picking um, picking up the pieces, doing a lot of monitoring, analysis, um, keeping the lights on. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for all the answers. Uh, we uh, well, we touched many important topics there, um, and uh, I would start with uh, with the node requirements so, or uh, also complexity of running nodes, right? So uh, now after the merge, uh, we need a mm, bit more complex setup. Before I was doing workshops for running nodes, which is like download and run this, right? Maybe with a specific command. Uh, now you need to download two things. You need to figure out the JWT path and um, and uh, also the hardware requirements went up. Like a huge kudos to Ethereum and ARM on uh, for for uh, being able to validate on on ARM devices, but um, so uh, what, what, what is your take on this? What do you uh, what do you think is uh, uh, now? Uh, how can we tackle this challenge of not just the node requirements? It's more like the protocol topic, but uh, uh, especially especially the complexity of running basically different pieces of software at the same time. Uh, in in terms of validators, this is very important because we want easy homestaking experience. So yeah, how can we achieve this? What, um, what is happening there? And with, with L2s, by the way, it's also, uh, uh, it's, it's also touches this because, especially with optimistic rollups, we want to be able to uh, run L2 node. We want to be able to create fraud proofs uh, in, uh, and it should be also easy experience. So um, yeah, how do, you, how do you see that? How do you? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, complexity is, is not a problem here because uh, the, the difference be between uh, running a node pre merge and post merge wasn't that uh, different. Um, but what, what, I've, what we, we've seen, in, in particularly in, in our uh, Discord channel, is people that 
uh, as they cannot get in sync the notes and they are uh, struggling with uh, with concession layer execution layer, um, they 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 were stressed because their validator were on, offline and and that's something that concerns us because uh, yeah if you uh, cannot get your validator online. Uh, it's it's a problem because people get stressed. I mean, uh, for us, it's not a problem because we are uh, in IT maybe 15, 20 years. We are used to it, but regular users are not. And my main concern is, well, if there are no much difference between uh, running an node at, at home, uh, a validator at home, uh, why I don't go to a, a pool? I take my 32 bits, send it to to a pool and, and and that's it. I don't take this uh, responsibility. I don't uh, get stressed. So that's uh, a concern in terms of, of uh, centralization of, of staking. Yeah, and I think that uh, it could be really great if uh, there's some way of uh, incentivizing the, the uh, stake at home. I don't know a, a protocol level or how. But it, it would be great because if not, maybe people are going to go this way of, of go to, to, to pools or, or these uh, great exchanges that uh, give you this service. So yeah, it's, it's, it's my main concern after the match. Uh, a little bit of history on me. I, I got into eStaker because I started staking and when I ran a validator, I saw a lot of comments in the subreddit that I was using to set, set it up that like, oh, you have to be really good with command line to do this. You have to have Linux experience. You have to be a developer. And I was like, I am none of those things. I, I successfully set up a validator. And so I started commenting in there and being like, no, this can be done by anyone. There are lots of tools to reduce the complexity of it. And we do need to like support those tools. Uh, support those tools more so that they are well fleshed out and have good documentation. And eStaker aims to uh, maximize the decentralization of the network, which means that we want people not depositing their 32 ETH and all in a centralized exchange, for example. Um, and so we really just need people to, we need a centralized, a centralized place where people can go to, to get the uh, information that they need. Because right now, there are a bunch of different protocols putting out a bunch of different information and it's really difficult to find all of your options all at once and find what the best option for you is. Like you don't have to be, you don't even have to use command line really to set up a node. If you use DAP node or any of the other Avato or uh, Wagyu or any of the tool staking tools that are built out. Um, and so that, that sort of um, needs to be illuminated a little bit better. Yeah, I'd echo that. I think the um, I think the clients generally are not particularly good at making things um, usable for non-developers. I think the the way that we hire is usually for people who are more systems programmers, so people who are like kind of thinking about you know like what it what are the bits look like coming out of your networking interface, um, and we're not it's not something we're interested in, and in, in generally, and not something that we're particularly good at is is like thinking from the perspective of someone who doesn't, isn't familiar with using the command line and stuff like this. So we really, we, like we do our best to try and make it so that it's um, like it's straightforward and it's clean and that usually leads to it being simple. But I think it's really a place where um, the community needs to come in and help is when it comes to usability. So like at Staker with like supporting with people how to use things. And I know there's like nice nose and some other um, uh, initiatives out there to make it so that you can kind of wrap the creating a node into a like a user interface or something that's easy to use. I think it's a really good place for people to come along and, and, um, and innovate. Because if, if you think about it, um, the, the amount of people who are like comfortable with um, maintaining a node on a command line interface who are also interested in Ethereum is such a teeny tiny amount of the world and who has 32 ETH. That's like already a teeny tiny amount of the world. Um, yeah, so if we if we try to uh, keep it at the people who can like run a validator, a 32 ETH validator with 100% effectiveness, you're going to get a very centralized set of operators. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, right, I, so I noticed this totally on the workshops when I'm setting up, uh, help somebody to set node and the command line comes in and just wall. 
just get scared. Like that's that's crazy thing. Why would I use this this devil's whatever command line? Yeah, that's 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 too much for most of the people. And uh, I really very much appreciate tools which make it easy. Also, to remote arm. I mean, just flashing it and and running. Yeah. Uh, it's it's it's. Uh, there are other options like tap download or Apple or, or that make this they have this great interface uh, with. Uh, web menu or this two clicks and you have a node so yeah I mean uh, there are other solutions as command line uh, our, our our project is uh, yeah is focused on on this kind of, of devices or low devices but uh, overall there are other projects that make it easy for users uh, to to run a node or, or validate so yeah I mean even with uh, Ethereum on ARM or this eat docker kind of stuff it's still command line but it's, it's yeah. minimum amount of commands right so it, it gets like doable even for people who can get scared first um, yeah I think that people with without uh, technical skills would be able to run a, an Ethereum on an ARM yeah. node yes it's documented it's you you have to follow the guide and and yeah I mean it's better that you have if you have Linux experience for example she said but uh, yeah <laughs> but yeah you you could uh, even even run a node with with no with no technical skills yeah sure if I, uh, so I have pretty fresh experience of running uh, if POS node and actually the the biggest problem for me was that uh, you know you need to realize that now you're running two pieces of software together right like consensus client and the execution uh, client and um, I think like the documentation that I read didn't make it like crystal clear for me and that was like one thing but then you know the merge I, I was totally not sure if it's gonna work if it's like correctly configured because it's like it, it's 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 been working but I wasn't sure if like the you know jet engine RPC works correctly like I, I think after merge it's like gonna be easy to realize that it doesn't work because it's not going to be syncing but you know during the merge I was like okay I, I have totally no clue if it's going to work like we're, we're not staking so it's not it wasn't like a huge deal uh, but still it was kind of stressful and you know like now we have like you know this modular to two parts of the client and in the future we're going to have new module uh, new layers like I don't know a data availability layer on top of EIP 4844 and it's going to be even harder for people to, to run all that stuff so yeah again docs we're we getting there and uh yeah first i want to ask what kind of documentation you read whether i think I, it was prism okay okay i wrote the ethereum org documentation on running notes so i uh, <laughs> whether it wasn't clear <laughs> yeah um and but i i was i had trouble explaining it like i realized how much how much complexity i'm adding to the documentation there but like so so just to sum it up what i believe we agree on it's very useful to have uh the automatized setup tools uh which minimizes the, the technical requirements also because like uh, I'm not sure whether I set up correctly or I leave some secu security hole there and so on and also the education it's really important huge kudos to each staker for that and now uh, so regarding upcoming stuff now like uh, the merge uh, opened many doors opened many interesting possibilities and um, like uh, generally before 4844 <laughs> we already mentioned one thing but uh, uh, but uh, are there any maybe other than that, or uh, uh, even even including this, what, what are you now excited for, or maybe afraid of? What are the biggest uh, uh, biggest upcoming uh, things for uh, for the Ethereum, which will influence you? Uh, this coming, yeah. Okay, I, I can kick off this discussion. So for me, uh, like I was surprised to learn that uh, you cannot stake more than thirty two ETH at the same time right right now i mean you need to have separate like uh, validators validator clients yeah yeah and i i found it quite strange especially for like you know these big staking pools like uh and i'm excited that this is gonna be fixed i think in the in the future even near future i'm not sure here <laughs> but that was something uh unexpected to me and also like you know the, the reasoning behind like you cannot do this right now was also pretty interesting to to learn Thank you. Uh, so coming up soon in the protocol will be withdrawals, which I think are pretty exciting. So there's an EIP, EIP out there that is pretty well supported by the teams, and it seems like that's going to happen. So that'll be um, automatic withdrawals to the execution chain. So it means that uh, if you've already withdrawn or if you do withdrawn, then um, at some point um, your ETH is just going to appear 
as in your F1 address um, and you can claim it. Uh, and then for people who are still validating, once you get over 32F, um, maybe once every couple of months or something like this, um, it'll be just kind of dropped into the execution chain and you can get at it. Um, so that'll be pretty exciting, I think. Um, I think the panel is on inspiring people to build things. Is that is that right? Um, let's say, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, the what's interesting with that is that it'll dump the F into a uh, an address, but it won't trigger any code, it won't do code execution. So typically, like in Ethereum, if you do an F transfer, you can, you can when it lands in the account, you can trigger some smart contracts to create a log and then people can know that they got their F. Um, that won't be the case um, in this event because it's just... Just to clarify, like, because it's kind of country initialized by the protocol, right? So called, right? So that's, that's the current specification. Um, yeah, that's right. So there is a slight complexity to it that, um, f when in the early days of um, the beacon chain, we weren't sure how withdrawals were going to work. So um, it was a BLS key that you put in as your withdrawal credentials. Um, that's now what people now we decided that we're going to withdraw into an Ethereum address. So that means that users are going to need to users who have used the BLS withdrawal credentials, which is probably most, um, will need to submit a message on chain um, signed by that key that. That, that elects a um, Ethereum address to receive those funds. Um, so I don't know how far I want to go into it here, but yeah, that, that'll, so what once users have done this kind of once-off action, then yeah, the, the withdrawals are going to be automatic and they just land in there, which I think is really cool because it's less for people to do, it's less stuff happening on the network. Uh, it's cool. Can I, can I add just one thing? So you mentioned that the withdrawal can be yet another way to force ETH into an account without code execution. Okay. It's like the self-destruct uh, trick. Yeah, now. Yeah, right. Oh, that, that's good to know. <laughs> it's actually how Coinbase works at the moment. So the mining reward is delivered in the same way. So it's not it's not too too weird. Uh, Nick, you had a question? Uh, no, no question, but a comment. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, following on the withdrawals topic, I'm actually really excited for withdrawals because a lot uh, when people when the Beacon Chain launched, there were very few options to stake. And since people have staked, they have not been able to withdraw and maybe change which protocol that they're using if they're not running a full node. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of opportunity to shift things around and maybe address some of the centralization risks that um, have been brought up. And so I'm excited for that. And I'm excited for um, any documentation that's going to be uh, written up prior to that in h about how to withdraw correctly and what protocols are the best protocols to um, deposit into if you're not running a full validator at that point. Or there could be p people who have stacked um, 32 ETH in that time and want to run a full validator. Yeah, from, from our perspective, uh, after the merge, uh, realizing that uh, you could uh, create a block in this in, in Ethereum uh, with a, a device that consumes 10 bots was like whoa! I mean, this is this is amazing. This is great. This is this feels feels great. I mean, uh, and yeah, we didn't propose a block yet, but <laughs> we are still waiting. So, <laughs> and uh, on the other hand, I, I I am very interested in in two use cases that I I hope that once the merge uh, went through and and L2s are, are thriving, that uh, they were part of, of the initial uh, Ethereum design, this Web3 and, sorry, uh, storage decentralization, it was Swarm protocol, we have IPFS uh, as well, and, and decentralized messaging. Uh, I think uh, that these two cases are, are uh, I hope that uh, in the coming months or years we'll get an, an impulse because I think they, they are very important to succeed for, for, the, for, for Ethereum. Yeah, I'd love to see non-financial use cases. Yeah. I did really never imagined myself yeah. in a fintech role. Yeah. That's not why I started here, so and, I'd be keen to see that. And everybody uh, asks you, what, what are you doing? I'm in the blockchain Ethereum. Ah, oh, what can I buy? <laughs> I mean, well, no, no, it, this is not about that. I mean, yeah. That's why why we're saying this. Yes. Um, thank you so much for the answers. Um, so, yeah, we tackled a uh, few important things here, and there is actually big uh, discussion uh, in the community right now. So, what should be the priority? 
uh, whether it's for eight for four, whether it's with roles, whether we should try to put them together in Shanghai or separate. Um, and uh, so your voice of communities, folks, so what do you think has the priority for you? What is, uh, considering maybe the complexity and whatnot, uh, what, what, do you, uh, what do you find uh, uh, more important and doable right now, whether it's withdrawals or 4844, which, I mean, there are many other things, but I will mention these two because we get into them. Man. Yeah, so I guess uh, for me, obviously, it's 4844, which will help us with scaling Ethereum. And I guess uh, you know the, the the teams working at uh, working on uh, different uh, client implementations can have like you know better knowledge about what to prioritize. But the funny thing is that Prism got Pride Labs got acquired by Arbitrum, so I guess <laughs> uh, there will be more consensus there <laughs> about prioritizing for eight for four. Uh, but yeah, uh, like. I believe that uh, you know Ethereum in the past failed uh, scaling uh, in scaling game, and that's why uh, not only things like you know Solana not only exist but also got traction, but also things like Polygon, right side chains, and uh, like you know um, user may, my, users might not realize the, all the different security properties uh, of associated with using these different uh, blockchains or, or solutions. So. Um, I think that should be like the the very uh, high priority on uh, Ethereum devs list to 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 solve or improve the the scaling of the whole system and uh, for eight for four is like the easiest way to to accomplish that. Yeah, I don't have a, a strong opinion about that, but I would say that uh, if if uh, for eight for four means uh, scaling and lowering fees, I would offer that. Yes. And from the perspective of running the node, uh, what do you think about the 4844? Like, whether I mean, there is a big overhead on the consensus client side uh, by storing more data. Um, of maybe Paul, Paul, maybe Paul can can say is it. Is it that significant, Paul? I think I think it's uh, the the numbers haven't been chosen for 4844, yeah. but it's looking on the order of maybe like 200 to 400 gig extra disk space. Um, there'll be some more network um, usage as well. So we're very sensitive to these things, and we really don't want to set them high. So I'm I'm one of the guys that wants low values. So um, yeah, less less usage. But yeah, we're still we're still figuring it out. But there there'll be an impact on disk, uh, and there'll be an impact on network. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that the, the bottleneck wouldn't be uh, a problem with with network and disk. So I think it it would be uh, we we will be good with this. I'm not going to pretend I have enough expertise to talk about um, what should be a priority at the protocol level, um, but I would say not at the protocol level. I think that just a abstracting the technical um, barriers from the user or from the staker is the things that I see, like um, and interoperability. Um, I don't know if you guys have had any issues, but like when you make a deposit to the deposit contract, going through like Ledger, MetaMask, the deposit contract can have all sorts of issues. And it would be great if uh, those teams focused on the interoperability of those things. Yeah, sure. I, I thought I should let uh, everyone else speak before a client dev talk to, to, hear, to hear what people want, because that's what we should be driven by. Uh, in, so the question of um, withdrawals or 4844, uh, for me personally, I am prioritizing withdrawals. I feel like the merge is not really done until withdrawals are complete, because I think that we're kind of, um, we, we did the beacon chain on this promise that we'll let you withdraw one day, and the longer that we do that, it just feels a little dishonest to me. So in my opinion, the next four withdrawals have to happen. Uh, and then it's a question about whether or not 4844 comes with it. Um, yeah, I think myself and the other de developers uh, kind of flip back and forth between like, yeah, yeah, we can do 4844. No, 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 we can't do 4844. So yeah, I'm not sure. We're, like we're, we've, we've had a bunch of meetings on it this week, making progress, checking it out. Be cool if it came in, um, not explicitly for it or against it. Um, yeah, thank you. Um... Yeah, so like considering the topic should be like what to build after the merge, right? Um, uh, I think we mentioned many great things. Uh, I mean, contributions on the protocol level to withdrawals, to uh, for it for for the testing, and uh, the the staker infrastructure, the education. There is so many things to do right now. Uh, one one thing I wanted to add is light clients, uh, which after the merge uh, can actually become 
usable thing, and um, and uh, that, that can, uh, I believe, also uh, largely um, uh, advance the experience of running the node or uh, just being able to participate with our third party, right? Um, do we have time? Five minutes. Um, um, so um, I have one more question, but maybe are there any questions from audience as well? Feel free to raise a hand. Uh, just wanted to give a space. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks for all the work all you and your teams do, by the way. Um, curious what you think about home stakers and other folks using MEV Boost, and if you have any concerns around that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have concerns about MEV Boost and MEV. Um, I have been a little disappointed with how MEV um, has gone since the merge. I think. Uh, it's it's probably a f not anyone's fault, perhaps, of the way that we, we coordinate the merge, but I think that MEV has kind of showed up not in the same readiness state as the clients have. So there have been some problems with MEV Boost that have been um, a little disappointing from my perspective, um, things that should have been caught already, things that should have been caught with testing. So I like I have a lot of respect for the Flashbots team. I think they've done a lot of good stuff, but I'm still very, very cautious about MEV, MEV Boost. Um, I also worry, uh, we've also seen some problems with other um, builders where they've, um, uh, they, they, they've been unable to produce blocks and they can get themselves in a position where the validator is already committed to a block and then they fail to actually follow up on their part and produce it, which means the validator can't actually produce its own block. So we've seen missed proposals due to um, MEV. We're seeing a lot of late blocks due to MEV. Um, so yeah, and I've also seen some of these scenarios where MEV, um, like MEV Boost or MEV um, Builders um, have problems and they don't alert the community quick enough. They don't come out with an announcement saying, hey, like, w we have a problem and we're not critical, so please just turn us off until we fix it. I haven't seen that from them. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually a little bit unhappy with MEV and the state of it. I think it'll get there. Uh, my advice to people would be, like, if you, if you cannot run MEV, just don't because um, you, you, like it's better for the protocol and you're also not like, you know, sandwiching people just trying to like, you know, sell their money. So, but I can also totally appreciate why people would do it. And I was one of the people that pushed for including the builder API into, um, like including support. Like I pushed for consensus clients to support MEV boost because I knew it was going to happen, um, by some people and I wanted it to be safe. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my thoughts on it. I'm particularly concerned with uh, censorship because uh, some uh, some relays that are uh, uh, running on on countries like USA that uh, uh, you know uh, some uh, regulator says now that uh, tornado cash is illegal, so these uh, uh, these builders will not include this. Uh, these blocks with, sorry, these transactions with uh, three tornado cash. And this bothers me because uh, if we are using MEV with, uh, for example, uh, Flashboot, uh, are we, are we sensor, censoring uh, transactions? Uh, maybe so, if, if we are uh, using their, their layer. So um, it's, it's a little concerning, yes. Um, thank you so much for the question. By the way, it was it was my last question, the censorship. <laughs> I wanted to drop the negative bomb on the end, right? <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so like the the, the um, like you already mentioned it. Like there are because of the MEV boost, because of the these relays, uh, the validators are currently censoring blocks, and it's over forty percent right now of blocks yeah. which are OFAC compliant. So, no good. Um, and uh, there is uh, the PBS, which is. I would say just a meme right now. It's just like, uh, yeah, that there will be PPS. We'll somehow solve it in the future. But like the problem is that the the longer we wait, the harder it might be to solve, right? So, uh, uh, Paul, thank you so much for mentioning uh, or like encouraging people actually not to run the MEV boost. Or I would say uh, you can use non-censoring relays. Uh, there are these options. Uh, do you have Do you have any other other? Yeah. Sorry, Paul. Uh, the, the idea is to include MEV in, in at protocol level. I'm, I'm right, or, or? Uh, so, I, uh, as in what I said about including it in the consensus client. Yeah. Yeah. So the so what 
so pre before the merge, we had MEV geth, which was like if you wanted to do MEV stuff, you needed to run this fork of geth in order to do, like to do this stuff. And a lot of people were running it, which meant that a lot of people were running um, a fork of a consensus client by a team that is not considered to be client developers. Um, so I thought that was not great. So what we did with the consensus clients was was to add uh, was to get Flashbots to, to instead create a separate service and then we support an API to talk to it. Um, so what this means is that um, like Flashbots no longer needs to, to fork all these consensus clients and then like th either do a lot of work or jeopardize client diversity. Um, and it also meant that now the consensus clients choose when to use these builders, these MEV builders. So we have um, like fail safes in there to say like if the chain is unhealthy in a particular way, then let's just like cut MEV uh, because it could be the problem for it. Um, so at, at the moment, like the protocol doesn't support it. The, the implementations kind of acknowledge that it exists and try to and try to do it safely. I always, like my um, the way that I think about it is like um, drug use. Like it'd be great if it didn't happen, but it's going to. So let's make yeah. let's make it safe. Um, great example. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, yeah, and then in the future, the protocol wants to support the ability for the validators not to be the ones that that build the blocks. Um, so whether those blocks contain MEV, they probably do, um, but that that would be a bit of a better solution to it. Great. Um, anything to add, folks? Uh, if not, I think we are yeah we are uh, past our time, and uh, uh, I would like to say a huge thank you, uh, not f just for attending this panel, but especially for all the work that you do uh, in your project. It's it's uh, what pushes the Ethereum. Well, to succeed, right? So uh, thank you so much again uh, for your work, for being here. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for attending the panel. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.